Thank you, Mirna, for your um, sweet and, and extensive uh, introduction. And thank you more than anything for inviting me to be here today, which is a pleasure and an honor to be with so many amazing speakers and the league in the first place. So, we know that cities are polluted. And we need to know. And then the we, of course, please always take it with all the reservations that um, Mirna has just um, very well articulated. Even if we know that is polluted, what is less clear and challenging, let's put it that way, um, and, and difficult is to think about what to do about it. However, it feels as if it was a new problem, but it is not, obviously. And we know from history that cities were um, heavily polluted and actually the air was visible. And this is something that... Um, having been born in Europe in the late 20th century, feels uh, <laughs> um, it was not visible at the time. So I personally hadn't had the experience, I had the privilege of not having had the experience of seeing how air looked like. But then mid 19th century, then great smog in London, and yet all the answers that we've had available have been um, explored, let's say, um, and put forward through technology. And as you can see here, technology that is usually related and developed and sponsored by the energy production companies, which is in this case... Um, People, um, a company working on uh, furnaces, but also, as we will see later, all companies um, and basically sand companies, all the ones that are actually deeply invested in the fuel industry. And the idea is that one can go back from a polluted city to an ideal smokeless city. But can we? So as a response, there's been this idea that technical solutions are going to be the answer. And some of them are machines, but some of them are spatial, architectural. So there's been a lot of investment from many different fields in thinking about what could be the solution. Of course, isolation is not the solution. Even uh, back Mr. Fuller, when he did this project, he realized that actually the price of the apartments inside the dome would be way more expensive because people could breathe clean air. And therefore, the capacity to breathe was a class, an economic issue, obviously. And this is still on because there's companies that are building bunkers for the wealthy. Um, you're welcome to see the beautiful design of the interior of uh, some of these bunkers. And they have the promise that one can escape. There's also geoengineering projects, large technical developments that are trying to do something, and this do something sometimes sounds um, paradoxically easy, so purifying air. These massive towers in the middle of developments selling um, these uh, massive infrastructures that they're going to allow everyone to breathe clean air. All these infrastructures are always situated in areas where there's no people, in these no man's land um, spaces. I love this one because it's in the, uh, in the Alberta, in Alberta, in the tar sands extraction area. And actually, one sees how Chevron and Bill Gates are working together in order to develop these technologies to make massive profits. So in a way, it's the same system trying to reinvent itself. And with this imaginary where technology is 
the solution, the, si the shiny um, and yet clean solution to pollution. And then I ask, okay, so what are the infrastructures that we need? Are they these? There's a big debate within your engineering um, context where people are saying, well, maybe all technology is bad, therefore we don't need them, we cannot afford them. Of course, all these technological developments have lots of problems, A, land extraction and colonialism, but also um, they pollute, they uh, take resources. So how do we deal with what is already there? And there's other um, proponents that say that actually, even though we might be able to stop polluting, we still need to clean up all the air that is already polluted and therefore we need negative emissions. So what to do is actually not clear for anyone. And yet I keep thinking, what are the infrastructures to leave, to deal with, to know, and maybe to change the composition of air? Is it something that we need to see? Is it visibility a key element of it? I love this image. I'm sure you saw in the news. I was fascinated by the story that I read in the news and then I read that it was not true, but um, so, but the story was great. So um, it was such a disappointment, I have to say, because they, they released um, pictures of this and another one with the sunset saying, well, actually now Beijing needs to show the, the sunset through a screen because obviously smog doesn't allow anyone to see the real uh, sunset. Um, the story goes that it was an ad for a travel agency. Still, it puts the, <laughs> the question on the table and I think it's, it's, a, it's a very good one. To what level do we need to embrace that pollution is here and that it cannot be solved as these massive infrastructures are telling us? Do we need to change the conditions of visibility of cities? Do we need to change how we see and talk to each other? Does seeing air or air pollution change the way in which we think about it and the ways we engage politically? So some of my research has been invested in trying to make air visible because I thought at the time, it started in 2008 with the Project in the Air, collaborative project developed with lots of amazing people and throughout many different iterations where I thought, I was uh, convinced that by making air visible, we would have a better understanding of how it works um, and then therefore what to do about it. So instead of going for the quick and easy information of whether the air is polluted or not, I was wondering, well, can we know more about it? So making the visualization more complex instead of more simple. So this is the last iteration or in regards to the visualization of in the air, which took Madrid as the case study in part because it started in Madrid. So here you're seeing the levels of particulate matter, and this is 24 hours of the day in Madrid. We go to nitrogen dioxide. And something that I'm still always perplexed about is how... How deeply connected is the air of a city with its activities. It's almost like a literal description of it. It's a mirror. Part of the questions of this project were oriented towards what do we do with places like Madrid, for instance, that 
are not the most polluted in the world. They don't have any particular chemicals, fortunately, that are deadly and easily identifiable and yet in many places never sensed or monitored. But what do we do in these places where it doesn't seem to be a major urgency and yet we know that it's a very, very, very slow death um, and very, very invisible? Does it matter? I was wondering when doing this video why we why we chose this uh, perspective because it's the Gran Vía in Madrid which is like representative, you see the palaces, and I was wondering, well, what about environmental injustice? How, how can we bring it all together? But then there's questions about that are connected to air, which is Madrid doesn't have tall buildings. And this was one of the only towers uh, available. So what is the air asking for? And then by doing these projects, what I'm very interested in is in trying to understand and unpack and see and learn the socio-technical assemblages that are enmeshed, that are part of gases and particles. But then another question rises, which is, do we need to see more? How much pollution do we need to make visible? What is at stake and where does it matter to make it visible? And then after having been asked lots of times, so what did that project do? Did it change behavior? Did it, um, and because it didn't, uh, and at the time I thought that that was the failure of the project, we continued thinking about how do we engage with data uh, and thinking that maybe data, and of course reading about it, data is not always received as it's been sold, that is interpreted or, or taken in. Seeing, knowing doesn't imply behavioral change and action. So, so then what do we do? So then we thought, well, what, what if we skip the seeing? What if we move away from numbers and think about sensing the mediations of data? So this is a project that Mirna was uh, mentioning before, Commission for the Sol Biennale of Architecture and Urbanism. And we had conducted a prototype in Madrid in 2008 but then we thought, not also what we want to sense um, in relation, not only how we want to sense, but also what do we need to sense? Because, but like um, pollutants can be zillions of them. Um, and some are even not even pollutants because they're part of the atmosphere. So what do we want to see? What is worth seeing? And then we learned that in Seoul in particular, there's a lot of um, there's lack of responsibility on who pollutes in particular particular matter because they receive these yellow dust storms from Mongolia and and uh, and China, but they come in the spring and even though they come only for two weeks. They are always represented as they are the sources of pollution in Seoul. So it's this other that invades us. We don't have any responsibility. So we thought, what if we make visible the particular matter that exists in Seoul at a, in a specific place? What if we measure or sense the air that we are breathing at that specific spot? And what if instead of showing numbers, we dilute that precision, and instead of asking how much, we communicate an intensity, an intensity that takes time to get to know what it means, an intensity that also can be felt because it's water vapor. And then we see, but we also sense, we feel in our bodies and in our skin, in our breath. And what if we also use the opportunity that water vapor sediments, particulate matter, what if we use this opportunity to 
test or experiment with remediation strategies. For these, we had to build the whole DIY system ourselves with the intention that it could be replicated and rebuilt or redone in contexts where communities, groups, people may want to make their air invisible. So in a way, not having to depend on the location of the monitoring stations, on different political, economical requirements, but being able to do it themselves and choose where and how they want to make it visible. But we also try to experiment on what it takes to do an infrastructure that makes the air visible and sensible. So water consumption, energy consumption, and this was deeply related to geoengineering projects. The questions that they pose, which is in order to clean air, what are we um, exploiting? What are we using? What are we extracting? Which is a very difficult question to answer, and yet I believe every project should do so. And then, of course, um, this is more, maybe an architecture um, detail, but what does it mean to draw a project that cannot be drawn because how do you draw intensities? And, and then we thought, well, in order to make it repli replicable, then we'll, we'll draw as if it was a, a, a map, a plan or a map, the, the functioning of the system so that it could be re replicated with the code uploaded online. So, so what happened was at the beginning what you saw in, in this video. And uh, I was with Emma Garnett, uh, an anthropologist uh, very dear in this house. And we did an ethnography of what happened when people encountered these, whether, whether sensing with your body instead of um, getting to know the number and connecting it with all the information that one may have related to air pollution. How do people react? And at the beginning, we were really frustrated by this video because kids were playing, people were enjoying it, people were taking pictures, and we were like, no, 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 this is a very serious, <laughs> this is not a playground. This is, this is like, this is a serious matter, and here we need to discuss about air pollution. And of course, we tried to make people talk about air pollution, no one wanted to talk about air pollution, in part because it was a biennale, and people want to see stuff. So it's also really interesting that location matters, but matters not only in terms of space where you're sensing, but also the context where you are at. The idea was to do this on a, on a, on a street um, for many different practical reasons that couldn't happen. But I don't think that's the only excuse in a way. Um, and then after the, the ethnography, we learned or we, we came to think about what happened as uh, data intimacies, where um, queer, molecular, queer molecular encounters, which were going through the nose or the skin, but then through the lungs, but then to the brain again, we're breathing pollution. So even though it might look beautiful, it shows what you, we, when we are there underneath, are breathing, and therefore it relieves a little bit, but then it shows what other things that we wouldn't like to be breathing, we are breathing. So it's a very um, difficult to articulate with words and yet felt sensation that something complex and slightly weird is happening. And actually some people like run away when they knew what it was. Some other people thought that we were um, suffocating them. They're like, no, 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 this is just water. Um, and, and, then, and then the fear that it gets in our head when we see a cloud of, of something. Uh, some people thought that it was heavily polluted, some others. So the, the, the responses to what could be pollution were also really, really inter interesting to figure out. And then 
we learned that these data intimacies produced three main uh, responses. The first one was that people started sharing with us their experiences or the connections to air pollution activism or practices. So they started showing us the um, apps that they use every day, the movements that they know that are happening or they've been involved in. So instead of asking us how much, because that was my my biggest fear, people are going to ask us, yes, yes, but but how much? Um, what are the numbers? How much particulate matter is suspended in this air? And actually, that was never a question. People started sharing their experiences with air pollution when they learned that saunas and barbecue restaurants are not large emitters, but make a contribution of particulate matter to soul's air. People started understanding like questioning the their responsibility and their personal relation with the particular matter that they were breathing with a big surprise, actually, because either it was something out there or something that factories produce or something that cars produce, but it's never connected to our everyday life and even less with places where they celebrate their communal life. So changing the question again from how much to who is polluting and how do we relate to that was a major change in our view. And that was exactly the change that we aimed at the beginning of the project. Can we change the, the, the conversation or the questions that we discuss about air pollution? And then it created this um, effect with the installation that by enjoying it, people stayed more. Some people stayed uh, just refreshing themselves, so it was also conditioning the, the public space. But also we learned that people were, by enjoying it, they were asking their peers or friends who were in other areas to come here. They would start asking questions because they were like, what, what is this? Like, um, and then that was the entry point to discussions about air pollution. So the first intuition to just like stop um, the playfulness of it. We learned that actually it was like a much slower and, and, and maybe more curious response to the issue instead of a responsibility as citizens that we need to take care of. And it became part of the background. And again, what of pollution are we interested in knowing? We know from the pandemic, one of the very few good news, we can say after the first five days of lockdowns in cities was that air pollution dropped. And that was really, really big news. And it seemed that we had the answer to it. So if we stop, then things are going to get better. Therefore, we can do it. It's easy. We, we, we see the results. People started listening, um, birds, um, smelling differently. So there was a, there was a strong felt understanding of pollution. So actually, there was no need to look at the numbers. People, at least in, in the UK, people are not looking at the, at the air quality data platforms every day. And yet there was, there was the experience of it. But then I was wondering, is it actually, is it as they are putting it, which levels have been um, reduced and what are the, how do they relate to the functioning of the city? This understanding that when the city stops, then the air stops. So I don't know if you remember that in, in the middle of the lockdown in the UK, it's been in different times, uh, in different places. So I remember that when we, when we were in lockdown, the um, Royal Observatory of Belgium, there was a news that the seismographs had, for the first time, heard very, 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 very um, deep um, earthquakes. And they were wondering, how is it possible that suddenly the, the seismographs became more sensitive? Like, we don't understand. 
they thought that the sensors had broken. But actually, when they started thinking about it, they realized that actually what had happened is that the, the noise that seismographs, so the waves that seismographs count as noise is the vibration of the crust of the earth. And because the sensors, this sound was not there, then they could listen more. So actually the crust of the earth vibrates, but vib vibrates a lot. And I was wondering, so what if we cross the data of the sound of the belly of the earth and see what it whispers in relation to air pollution? So this was before the lockdown. This is from the beginning, January 1st in Brussels. And you see how the the earth is vibrating a lot. And then when it gets to the pink now, it's the lockdown. So it is true that NO2 decreased, but then ozone increased and increased quite a lot because of environmental conditions, meteorological conditions. And then it will go back to the, um, the um, uh, end of the lockdown and we see how it immediately goes back. So all the faith that we had that actually things might be able to change, um, we have the tools. It's so, so immediate that either it changes completely, either we freeze the city or these levels cannot be achieved. What was really interesting for me was to understand what it takes to environmental conditions to slow down. What do we need to do in, in cities in order to change some of these conditions? And then another question, the last question that I would like to pose is, again, what are we interested in sensing? And what do we take for granted of what's in the air? The particles, this is of course a project post lockdown, the viruses. What if we do sense us as polluters? Because during the pandemic, we saw how we bring viruses to the air. We expel them, we contribute with viruses as well as with all the many other things. So how do we breathe each other? Materially as well as socially, what happens when we encounter breath? Which was at least in my own experience, a very, very unique um, and, and um, disturbing acknowledgement of the pandemic. What are the filters, the masks and the containers that contain breath or contain air? or which airs or which bath. And then this was for an installation on vulnerable creatures in Madrid. And we were wondering how, what if we solidify the air of social distancing? And if we wanted to solidify the air of social distancing, how do we do it? How do we solidify air? so that we can still keep breath flowing. And how can we solidify air if we want it to be alive, diverse, and to react to its environment, so to perform like air? And how do we feel and how do we react to when we see changes of air and the traces of what it makes it visible? What are the traces of breath? So we designed these mediators to sense the air of two social distances, one, me one meter and 1.5. With windows, kind of um, less dense areas where one could actually have someone in front.
and testing what how can we imagine not only the solidity of air but also the possibility of it having virus having microbes having pollen having bits and pieces of us of our hair We wanted to fill them fully, but it was not possible because of the noise of the machine. And, and again, what does it take to make air visible? And how do we deal with, with an air that is permeable and yet it looks solid and that is alive? And the tension of breathing someone's air. And what happens when we recognize that air is multiple, and that's why we made them uh, very different, multiple and diverse. What happens when we smell and take in or sense the air that is between us? And what happens when we release our inside into the air? How do we react when encountering each other? And it was interesting to see how little time people spent because in the moment in which they recognized that there was another in front of them, even if they had 1.5 uh, meters in between, people immediately um, left the visual contact and left the situation because of the tension of understanding that one is in front of each other breathing. Uh, there were no masks at the time, it was this summer. But the, the, the interviews we made, everyone was speaking about the, 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 the tension of wanting to be close, but then understanding that that space might be filled, full and filled with um, pollen or viruses. And another question that was raised, what happens when we see the traces of our own air? And this was a blow in the foam. Thank you.